Come on, just praise the Lord. Oh, we thank you, God. We declare it is already done. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. We thank you, God. Oh, we worship you tonight, oh God, because you're worthy. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I be? Shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Who shall I be? I believe, 
shepherd tonight. Hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd. The 
Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't be. I'm filled with anointing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. I won't fear. I won't fear. Somebody sing hallelujah. Amen. 
Hallelujah. He is my comfort. And he does always hold me close. He sticks closer than a brother. He's with us always. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hori Arama Siri Arama Handarabaki. Bohori Arama Siri Arama Sandarabaha. Bosoria Mananama Siri Arama Siri Arama Si. Bohori Arama Sandri Arama Siri Arama Si. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence here tonight. It is so rich. We thank you, Lord, for your visitation. We thank you, Father, for being our Lord and our Savior. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Glory to God. Well, welcome to Wednesday night service. It's good to see you all here. Give each other a elbow, but don't touch each other. Just do the thing, you know, wave your hands and all that good stuff. It's glad to see so many of you out here on a Wednesday night. You're a blessing. And um, Pastor Jamie and Debbie obviously are not here. Pastor Debbie is up in Ohio ministering to her family, and Pastor Jamie will be here Sunday with a fantastic message because he's got all week to prepare for it. So I, <laughs> I know he's going to have a powerful message like he's been delivering every Sunday, but this will be awesome. So don't miss Sunday, um, 10 o'clock. We'll all be here just for one service. Um, is there anybody here for the very first time? Nobody. All home folks will praise God. And uh, tomorrow at uh, one, uh, 12 o'clock, we got noontime prayer. Uh, Pastor Beverly will be leading prayer tomorrow. So please come and join us at 12 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. And uh, there will be no home groups. For those of you that are in home groups, probably wondering when we're going to get started again. We're not going to get, get started for a while, probably not to the fall. And so just keep attentive. We'll let you know when um, we are going to start up home groups again. And uh, we do have for the leaders here uh, a roundtable for the next gen and the impact uh, leaders on Sunday, right after the service at the 28th of uh, June. So uh, make plans to stay after service that day. Now, next Wednesday night, will be a special night of just worship. So don't miss next Wednesday night. Be here. Come expecting. Come believing that the Spirit of God is going to flood this place like he's never flooded before. He's going to visit us like he never visited us before. So come with that expectation to see what God's going to do next Wednesday night. Hallelujah. Well, it's offering time, and we're going to do offering like we've been doing it. The baskets are in the back. I have a little something I want to read to you. Um, and you can deposit your offering on the way out. You know, God is always trying to get something. He's always stretching us, trying to get us from point A to point B to enlarge us, to enlarge our thinking. And, and in Luke 6.37, he says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You see, those are areas that are very hard for us to move in. We have something called the flesh that seems to get in the way all the time. But then it goes on to say in 38, Give, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You see, God 
loves a cheerful giver. And God loves it when his people give because he's, if he can get it through you, then he can get it to you. And if you hold on to it, you're not going to get the blessings that you should get. And so God, because he's a giver, he gave his only begotten son, and we are supposed to be like him. We too should be givers. And so I really am preaching to the choir. This is a giving church. This is, this is an awesome giving church. And so every time I get up here to do a, a little sermonette about giving, I'm like, why am I talking to these people? They know how to give. Uh, but this is for the people out there in the world that are watching this on live streaming. If you have any complaints, send them to Pastor Jamie. <laughs> So if you just bow your head. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this offering. We thank you for these giving people, Lord. I ask you to bless them, Father. Bless them going in and bless them coming out. And bless this offering, Father. Multiply it just like you multiplied the boys' lunch, Lord God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Mr. George, thank you guys. Who put this song list together tonight? Was that you? Was all of you? Well, this is, am this is amazing because you have you had no idea what I'm preaching on tonight. So I can sit down because you just sung my message and every one of those songs that you sang. So ladies and gentlemen, you have a good evening. May the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs> I'm not kidding. When you hear my message, you're going to say, wow, I should bring the singers back. <laughs> Tonight, I, I want to talk to you about the faithfulness of God. Amen. See, we here in America, we've been under the gun for the last five months. We've experienced an awful lot during that time. And in January, we started getting reports about this virus coming out of China called the Wuhan virus, now called a bunch of other things, some things I don't want to repeat. Um, but the, the, the information slowly began to come to, to us about the coronavirus. And by March, our church was shut down, schools were shut down, businesses were shut down, and toilet paper was nowhere to be found. <laughs> 
And from there, the situation even got worse. The reports from the news media fanned the flames of fear with their predictions and their death counts and their death tolls and all of the things that were happening in Italy and China and in America. And fear gripped our nation and gripped the world for that matter. But, you know, the Lord is so good. Back in February, when I was praying and seeking the Lord, um, the Lord began to deal with me. And he, he, I believe he, he told me, he said, look up the word trust in your concordance. So I did. And I was amazed to find all the scriptures with the word trust in it. It was obviously to me that the Lord wanted his people to learn to trust him because he repeated that over and over and over again. Now it's obvious that his people are slow learners <laughs> because they didn't get it. They didn't get the message. And so he did it over and over again. He was trying to teach his people to rely on him. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what's going on, your focus should be on him and him alone. And you need to apply your faith to his word. I would just like to share a few of these scriptures that I found concerning the word trust. In Psalm 511, it says, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you, let them ever shout for joy because you defend. Yes. Psalm 910, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Amen. In Psalm 17, 7, O oh, you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against you, against them. In Psalm 18, 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The Lord is making it very clear who he is and what he does and why you can trust him. His word is true and he is faithful to perform his word. He's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, that settles it. It's done. And we need to believe that with all our hearts. Now I'd like to share a story that illustrates my point. And I borrowed this from Max Lucado. How many of you know Max Lucado? Personal friend of mine, no. <laughs> okay, the 1989 Armenian earthquake needed only four minutes to flatten the nation and kill 30,000 people. Moments after the deadly tremor ceased, a father raced to an elementary school to save his son. And when he arrived, he saw the, that the building had been leveled. Looking at the mass of stones and rubble, he remembered a promise he had made to his child. No matter what happens, I will always be there for you. Driven by his own promise, he found the area closest to his son's room and began to pull back the rocks one by one. Other parents arrived and began sobbing for their children. It's too late. It's too late. They told the man, you know they're dead. You can't help. Even a police officer encouraged him to stop. But the father refused for eight hours, then 16 hours, 
then 32 hours, then 36 hours he dug. His hands were raw and his energy was gone, but he refused to quit. Finally, after 38 wrenching hours, he pulled back a boulder and he heard his son's voice. He called the boy's name, Armand, Armand. And a voice answered him, Dad, it's me. And then the boy added these priceless words. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them if you were alive, you would save me. And when you saved me, they'd be saved too. And because you promised, no matter what, I will always be there for you. And see, that's what our Lord promises for us, that he will always be there for us. Deuteronomy, and I, I'm sorry, I mean, I didn't give you any of these scriptures, but that's all right. These people, you're all going to know them anyway. Deuteronomy 31.6, I will never leave you or forsake you. Matthew 28.20, 20, I am with you always always, even to the end of the age. And I think he put that in there just especially for us because this is the end of the age and he's still here with us. After all these 2,000 plus years, he's still here with us. And finally, Psalm 23, 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You see, the Lord promises us, us that he's always with us and that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He'll stick closer than a brother because he's our Lord, because he loves us. So I gotta ask you a question. Are you that deeply secure in the fact that God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ will always be there for you no matter what your circumstances? How many of you say yes? Okay. How about when fear strikes and you're overwhelmed with fear? And I know that all of us at one time, at one point in our life, have had to deal with fear. You see, fear, it's a progression. The enemy, he likes to come, and the first thing he does, he tries to deceive you. He wants you to buy into a lie. Now, let me tell you something about Satan, and don't forget this. If his lips are moving, he's lying. Say that again. If his lips are moving, he is lying. Jesus called him the father of lies. That's what he does. And so first he gets you to buy into the lie. Now his deception, I mean, that's a key, or, uh, one of his key things in his arsenal. In fact, in, in Matthew 24, when his disciples were asking him, show us the signs, if you check it out, the very first sign he says is, do not be deceived. You see, it's a powerful tool because that's what the devil uses to deceive the whole world. Lies. And see, from there, you see, then fear comes in. Okay? Then the worry and the anxiety comes in. And then you begin to believe that something evil or bad is going to happen to you. And then from there, okay, your attention your attention begins to turn away from God. You begin to doubt his word. And doubt leads into unbelief. And see, that's how the devil works, and that's the progression. And so you all said, oh, no, I know. I know that God will never leave me or forsake me. But you get into that position, and this is what the devil do will do to you. This is how he works and how powerful he can be. They're all designed, doubt, fear, 
on belief and deception. They're all designed for you to take your eyes off God and put your eyes on your situation. You see, when you put your eyes on your situation, you're taking your eyes off God. Let me give you a quick, a quick point. Remember when Jesus was walking on the water and he came to the disciples? They left early. He took the late train, only he took the walking train on the water. Okay? And they saw him and they thought he was a ghost. And Peter said, Lord, if that be you, beckon me to come. And the Lord said, come. See, that's a sure word from God. He, heard, he had a sure word from God. And what did he do? He stepped out of the boat, and he was walking on the water. Until what happened? He took his eyes off the Lord, and he began to listen to the wind, and he began to look at the waves, and his mind kicked in and said, you can't be doing this. Humans do not walk on water. You see, he focused from God and the sure word of God to the situation and the circumstances, and he began to sink. And the next thing you know, he's yelling, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabbed them and pulled them up, and they both were in the boat. You see, as soon as you turn your away from the sure word of God that's in this book that I, it's over there, my book is over there, that sure word, when you begin to lose your focus and you begin to shift your focus from the word of God to the situation, that's exactly what fear does. Let me illustrate a story in the Bible. It's found in Numbers 13 and 14. I'm not going to read it to you. And you know the story. It's the story of the 12 spies. Okay, one from each tribe. Now, these just weren't regular guys that Moses picked to go on this uh, spy mission. These were the leaders of each of the 12 tribes. These were supposed to be men uh, of God, men who knew God because they sure work, well, walked with God all those times. And so the 12 spies went out. Now God had already told them, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. This was a good place. This was like going to the five-star hotel. Okay, this wasn't no ordinary. I mean, they've been tramping through the desert now for, for quite a while. And now they were going into the land of milk and honey. And so he sent them on a mission for 40 days. And they went around the whole area for 40 days, checking it out. And the 12 came back, and they all agreed that it was truly a land of milk and honey. In other words, this was a prosperous place. This is a place where you can grow crops, where you could raise animals, where you could settle down and be prosperous. This was a great place. But unfortunately, 10 of them came back with an evil report. And fear gripped them. And they came back and they said, the people are strong and their cities are fortified and very large. And that besides that, there's giants in the land. In other words, there's no way we can take this land. It's impossible. Now, you've got to understand the situation. These people, these leaders, have been with the Lord. They saw his miracle working power in Egypt when he delivered 10 plagues to set them free. They were with them when they got to the Red Sea. And the Red Sea was in front of them, and the Egyptian army was behind them. And they watched God part the Red Sea. And they walked through on dry land. And then they turned around and watched God close the sea, 
and bury all the Egyptian army. You know, they actually have found that actual place where they crossed. They have actually found chariots buried in the Red Sea and weapons and things. It's pretty amazing. They saw God feed them every day and give them water. Now people, this isn't a small group of people. We're talking about three to three and a half million people that God supplied for every day. Not only for them, but for their animals. And they come back, and because the cities are well fortified, and because there's giants in the land, they're in a panic. Fear has gripped their heart. Because what does fear do? Fear causes you to panic. It paralyzes you. It messes up your thinking. It makes you think irrationally. And so Caleb and Joshua, no one listened to their report. And Caleb was ready to go. He said, we can do this thing right now. Let's mount up. Let's do it. God is with us. But who, can, who can be against us? We can take these guys on right now. Let's go. Let's go do it. And these other guys, no way. We can't do this. It's impossible. So what did fear produce? What did fear produce? They instantly complained against Moses against Aaron, and against God. And then they rebelled. And they said, let's pick a new leader, let's turn around, and let's go back to Egypt. Let's get rid of Moses and Aaron, and let's turn this whole thing around. Now, see what I mean about irrational thinking? Do you really think the Egyptian pharaoh is going to welcome them back with open arms after their Lord wiped out his whole army? They can't be thinking straight. But they're so enveloped in fear. And Joshua and Caleb pleaded with them. Pleaded with them. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear these people because their protection has been lifted from them. Our God is with us. We can do that. But they didn't listen. In fact, after the Lord pronounced his judgment on them and told them what was now going to happen because they had rebelled against him, that they would not get to go. These people would not get to go into the promised land. Now you see, they were probably afraid because in all of their travels and everything that they had seen, it was the Lord who did it. But when it came to taking the promised land, the Lord gave it to them, but they had to take it themselves. This is the first time they had to do something. They had to take the promised land. God wasn't just going to put it in their hands. They had to go take it. But God was in the middle of it. He, didn't leave, he wasn't going to leave them alone. So when they realized what they had done, what did they do? Now they said, well, we're going up and take the Canaanites. We're going up the mountain. And Joshua, don't do that. Moses, don't do that. The Lord's not with you. You're going to lose this. You're going to die by the sword. Well, guess what? They did it anyway. And it's exactly what happened. 
and they got pushed back. So what did this fear produce? God's plans for them to enter the promised land were put on hold for 40 years. And all those who were over 20, they were going to die in the wilderness. And their sons, in the meantime, were going to become shepherds in the wilderness because they could not trust God. They let fear dominate them instead of faith. In spite of everything they had seen, they still let fear enter into their heart. Now, once again, we find ourselves in a brand new situation. Things are frightening out there. People are asking questions. Is this the end of America? What's going to happen? And people want change. They want to do something. They want to change the way things are. But as believers, how do we respond to this situation? What do we do? How do we handle it? Well, I'm done. Good night. <laughs> Come back next week. <laughs> See, I believe we need to respond just like Jehoshaphat, the king, responded. See, Jehoshaphat was in an impossible situation as well. He was surrounded by three nations that were coming to overrun his country. And in those days, if you overran the country, you killed the men, and the men that were left became slaves, and they took your wives and your children. And so, he said something very wise in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. For we have no power against this great multitude, that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. See, he had the wisdom to know, I don't have a clue. I have no idea. We don't have the power to match the enemy, and I'm at a loss. I have no idea how we're going to handle this, but Lord, I know you do. And so I put my faith and my trust in you. And God delivered. God told him, he said, you're not even going to have to fight. He says, I'm going to take care of the situation. And what, they, what happened was two of the countries attacked another one, wiped out that whole country, and then they turned on each other and wiped out each other. And the Israelites didn't even have to lift a sword. God took care of the situation. So, how do we respond? Same way. We get on our knees and we get on our face and we begin to seek the Lord. We begin to pray for the nation. We begin to pray for answers. I don't know what they are, but the Holy Ghost does. And you need to start praying in the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He's got all the answers. Because from what I read out there, nobody has any answers. They're looking, they're searching, and they're just not getting what God does. God knows them all. He knows everything. 
Some people want to say, well, we're in the tribulation. We're in the first four seals. No, we're not. We are not in the tribulation. How do I know? Because we're still here. Because the Holy Ghost is in us. Church hasn't been raptured, and he that withhold, uh, is holding back lawlessness has not been removed. So we're not in the tribulation. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Because there is a lot of, you know, that's the one thing about the internet. There's a lot of great information out there, but there's a lot of great misinformation out there as well. And it's tough them sometimes to sort through all that stuff and come up with the truth. But God knows the truth. And so, here we stand, once again, like the children of Israel. But we're not going to make the mistake that the children of Israel made. We are not going to be gripped by fear. We are not going to be driven by the media to believe reports that stir up fear. We're not. You told me you're not. You told me that you believe that you're God, okay? And we're not. Why should we trust God? Why should we? You see, in Revelation 19, 11, there's a great picture. It's Jesus on a white horse coming out of heaven. And he who sat on that horse was called faithful and true. See, the truth is his word. His word is truth. And he is faithful because he's faithful to perform it, to watch over it, to see that nothing comes back void, that it all accomplishes what he wants it to accomplish. And because he is who he is, we can hang our hat on him. We can, as the old said, we can take it to the bank because it's going to happen. And so there, don't let fear run your life because you got a God that's right there in the middle of it. Okay? Don't take your focus off God and put it on your situation. Because as soon as you start doing that, that progression is going to kick in. Your God is with you all the time. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's your God. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loved you before you even knew him. And so he's not going to abandon you now. You see, he's not going to move. The one who's going to move is you. Don't let that happen. Don't let fear do that to you. Stand strong. Hang on to the Lord, your God. For he will deliver you. Did you get anything out of this? See, I had, a, I had a quote, Jamie, there, because he always says that at the end. I mean, I, I didn't want anybody, you know, to miss that. Did you get anything out of this? And besides, you know, you get nice applause when you, when you, you know, it's, it makes you feel good that somebody got something out of what you had to say. Now, I'd like to end this service this way. Is there anybody here tonight who's dealing with a spirit of fear? Because I'll tell you, that spirit of fear, he likes to come at you at night because he's part of the kingdom of darkness. And he'll come at you at night and he'll come at you hard and you know when he's there because your whole countenance changes and, the, and fear comes all over you. See, I want to tell you how to deal with that guy. Is there anybody here having to deal with that now? One. But Rich, here's how you deal with this guy. Okay. Jesus said, we have, all authority has been given unto him. 
and we, he has given it to us. He said, we have authority over demons. We don't have to put up with them. We don't have to stand with them. See, I had a demon, and he was coming at me, and he was coming at me at night, and he was coming hard. And I knew when he was there, I started to, to perspire, and I started to get afraid, and I started to think of what the lie he was trying to get me to believe. And then I started to read God's word, and I started to read those scriptures that God gave me about trust, trusting him. And I started to read them over myself, Rich. And I started to get them deep inside of me. And then when I did that, you see, I told that son of a gun where he could go. I took authority over him, and I cast him out, and I told him, I told him, you don't come back here. Well, guess what? He came back the next night. You see, he wants to make sure that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. He wants to make sure that that first night you found something in the Word and you were going to try it out. So he came back the second night, and I sent him back packing the second night. He ain't been back since. So I tell you, if any of you are dealing with fear, fear is not who we are or what we have in Christ. Paul said we, have, we are not of spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. We don't have to put up with fear. You don't have to let it invade your life. You don't have to let it paralyze you. You take authority over it. And you send him packing. And make sure he doesn't come back and bother you anymore. And take that lie that he's, he and put it at the bottom of the sea. Because you're the child of the Most High God. And you don't have to put up with that for one second. Worship team? Where, we, we ain't got no worship team. Oh, did it. Where, oh here you are. <laughs> You're back. I'm looking over. I'm looking around. Why don't we sing that, that song that you sang, the very first one? Yeah. Let's, let's sing that. I mean, you sing that, because if I sing that, you'll all go home. <laughs>
done. Well, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord's peace be upon you. Go now in peace. Be safe. I pray Psalm 91 over you. No plague will come near your dwelling. I pray that God's angels be around you. See you Sunday for the greatest service we've ever had. God bless you all.